Thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone. It is a, it's a real uh, pleasure and honor to get to be here, especially as a longtime admirer of Wallace Stegner and a longtime um, lover of the Western landscapes, which I, which I also am. Um, I feel I should give a kind of disclaimer um, before I start, because what I'm going to say involves some reasons to be critical or at least skeptical of the um, entanglement of religion and nature. Uh, and so I'm going to sound like one of those heartless secular technocrats. <laughs> and in environmental law world, I spend a lot of my time and energy arguing with and against um, heartless technocrats and claiming they don't see half of what you need to see to understand these questions. So it seems that I'm just cast in a permanent contrarian role. <laughs> and it, it, it do understand then that I come as a, as a sympathetic critic. Um, so I want, I want to start by saying that the history of environmental law doesn't only go back as far as the 1970s, the sort of era of ecology and modern lawmaking that's much of what we've been talking about. The history of US lawmaking with respect to the natural world is as old as the country. Um, and it's involved at different times very different visions of nature and its value and our place in it. And each of these visions is still written into an operating, active part of American law. And each one still has political constituencies and even a claim on our identity and consciousness. Each one is sort of part of who we are. Now, why do I mention that? Um, I say it because each of these approaches to nature that is part of this sort of longer American cultural and legal inheritance has religious uh, roots and religious debts. Um, so for the first hundred odd years of the country's history, really the only respectable way to talk in public about nature, if you were talking with consequences, you were talking about politics and law and what we should do with the continent, the only respectable way was to understand nature is made to be developed made to be filled with settlement and cultivation. Wilderness was there to be cleared. The word they used actually with connection, in connection with wilderness was a kind of religious one. They always said wilderness had to be redeemed. And the bureau, the federal bureau that brought irrigation and private property to the West was the Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and this view of nature, that nature was made for us to complete by laboring on it and making it economically productive, was rooted in a long history of natural law and design theory. John Locke is one of its famous avatars, but he's only one of many. And you can see it throughout the so-called natural theologians and early naturalists of England and other parts of Europe in the 17th century and 18th century. Um, the very opposite of that view the view that Rabbi Jamie spoke about yesterday, or I would say embodied yesterday, what I think of as the romantic view of nature, that it contains spiritual portals that put us in connection with higher principles and higher reality. <clears throat> That's the way of talking about nature that now defines a lot of our natural park system that gets expressed in the national wilderness system. Um, and it too, carries forward a kind of religious impulse into the relation to the natural world, a very different one, a very different interpretation of what nature teaches us. The earlier one was that nature teaches us to labor and to turn the world from a wilderness to a garden. The second one teaches us that nature is a kind of counterpoint, a correction to the utilitarian, practical, laboring of everyday life, that it elevates us and shows us different possibilities, and that we should refrain from developing and, in fact, from working on it precisely to let it be and let it remain a kind of portal to something higher. Um, so these and the other ways of understanding nature that have been important in US history are, are reminders of a truth about I would say about Christianity, which has been the dominant religious culture in, um, in US national life, 
and really of any tradition that's as rich and articulate as Christianity, which is that they contain resources to talk and think in many different ways about a question like how we should live with respect to the natural world. Um, they can generate many kinds of answers, many competing answers. And in fact, the, um, the admirable and wonderful effort since 1970 to incorporate mainstream, to incorporate into mainstream Christian theology a real awareness of ecology and of the problems of the age of ecology that we saw Sally Bingham, among others, express so well yesterday, I think is a kind of triumph of and evidence of that fact that you can do things with these traditions that haven't been done before. So if the question is, what is the attitude of any religious tradition toward the natural world, I think the answer will be multiple. There will be several answers you can give from within that tradition. And indeed, US law and politics with respect to the environment continue to express different answers that we've given partly with religious roots through time. So I would like to ask a question then that's different from <clears throat> What is the view of Christianity toward the natural world, or of religion toward the natural world? Um, the question I want to address concerns a distinction between all religious views of the natural world and an alternative. Um, the alternative is the idea that um, the idea that the very thought that there's such a thing as a logic of nature, a purpose to nature, an order of nature that can teach us something about how we ought to live together and how we ought to treat the natural world is mistaken and misleading. You might call this a materialist view because <clears throat> it takes the view in most of its expressions that the world is matter and not meaning. The slogan associated with Thomas Hobbes, the world is matter in motion and nothing more. So you can link this idea to, you can find it in a kind of, um, in the modern idea of science and progress. It's exemplified in a liberal secular thinker like John Stuart Mill, who wrote an essay in 1871 called Nature, um, which could better be called Against Nature. Um, and I do think that every environmentalist, that I count myself an, an adamant one, should read and think about this essay. Because it's a serious, a morally and intellectually serious attack on the idea that we can make good use of the command to follow nature, respect nature, or abide by nature. Mill says in this essay that following nature is on the one hand irrational because nature is just a set of facts of which we are a part. So the command to follow nature doesn't tell us, doesn't add anything to um, the total reality of nature that we are already part of. That is, it would just amount to saying, do what you do. But more to the point, this was the real thrust of Mill's claim, that the, the recommendation to follow or respect or abide by nature is immoral because the phenomena that nature reveals when we look with a clear eye at it <clears throat> involve a great deal of senseless violence and suffering. Mill said, when we look at nature, we find that it's full of murder, torture, tyranny, anarchy. Think of, think of Otto Leopold's famous recommendation in San County Almanac to think like a mountain. And thinking like a mountain meant recognize that things have to starve and things have to prey on one another. And if you try to stop them from doing that, then the system of nature will fall apart. So viewed at one level of generality, nature is a harmonious, self-sustaining order. Viewed at another level of generality, it maintains that order through periodic massacres and constant predation and savagery. And Mill said, if we look to this to try to get guidance, it's only going to confuse us. Um, thinking like a mountain is inhumane, he would have said. And he said, we know we can see it this way. We can say nature is full of massacre because we see it through values that are not natural, values like mercy and justice. And he said, our duty is to transform the natural world. 
to make those values more powerful among ourselves, to free us from being subjected to nature's periodic massacres and pointless suffering. Um, so this thought I've just expressed, you might naturally think of <clears throat> as a product of the modern reforming scientific mind. Um, typical of a secular thinker in the age of, of Darwin and of confidence in progress and in human mastery over ourselves, over the social world, and over the natural world. That's partly true, of course, of Mill. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is that there's a very long philosophical tradition of arguing that humans can't live well until they stop believing that nature is meaningful. So when you look back to the texts of the ancient world, Greeks and Romans, you find that all of the elements of the theory of intelligent design, and by the Roman time of providential design, are present in certain dialogues of Plato and dialogues of Cicero. You also find represented there an alternative view, the view of philosophical atheism associated with Epicurus, the Greek, and his student Lucretius, the Roman poet whose uh, philosophical poem on the nature of things is, um, is a wonderful read, um, also worth reading for any environmentalist. And again, I consider myself one, um, <clears throat> an, an environmentalist attached to meaning and not just to matter. Um, so Lucretius was a materialist of a certain kind. Lucretius's argument was that the world was made of atoms and only atoms. It was matter in motion and nothing more. And that meant it was a world without room for a soul or for an afterlife or for intervention into natural processes by the gods. Now, the interesting thing, that just sounds like modern materialist scientism. The interesting thing is that the basis of this view was not empirical. The basis was ethical. And it went this way. The thought was that people live in fear of nature as long as they believe that it expresses the moral logic and judgment of the gods. Lucretius's paradigm was that you hear thunder and you wonder what you've done wrong. A disease strikes your village and you wonder who has angered the gods. And he said, this is nothing but the pointless, avoidable fear that arises from the mind entangling itself in its own webs of interpretation. And to make the world less fearful and the mind less afraid, we need to stop thinking of nature as full of judgments and portents yeah. and think of it as just things. Um, so this idea is not just an ancient curiosity. It was revived when Lucretius's poem was rediscovered in the 16th century and became influential by the 17th century. So Thomas Hobbes, Hobbes you may know, the Hobbes of Leviathan, um, life is nasty, brutish, and short in the state of nature. You'll recognize that. Um, Hobbes was a revivalist of Lucretius and Epicurus. Um, and his argument that people needed to build a political order to live securely together so that life would not necessarily be so nasty, brutish, and short anymore was part of an argument against the meaning people had assigned to nature up to that time. Like Lucretius, Hobbes believed we needed to drive out of nature all of the spirits and miracles and portents and signs that we had imagined to be there and build in the place of all of that a deliberate human construction of law and politics. Why? Because he thought both the interpretation of nature and the creation of sovereign law expressed the same basic human condition, which is that we are vulnerable, terribly vulnerable to forces we can't control. We're constantly in danger. We are even dangerous to one another. And so the mind strains constantly to see patterns 
that will enable us to predict and control and have an element of a modicum of security in the world. And that's why we see fairies and charms and ghosts. And Hobbes said, that's why we ask priests, this is Hobbes' claim, to tell us what the world means and what our lives mean. <clears throat> But he, he said, following Lucretius, this way of viewing nature just entangles us in superstition and in other people's invented stories about nature. It doesn't track the facts. This is the sense in which he is a materialist. Um, <clears throat> and the only way we can make ourselves secure is to step back from these confusing, misplaced acts of trust and instead deliberately construct a political order um, in which we can have some confidence and achieve some predictability and security. So we needed to deconstruct nature in order to construct politics and law. That was Hobbes's view. And he was, in a way, even more than Mill, the most powerful modern expositor of this idea that I'm calling philosophical atheism or maybe philosophical nihilism with respect to nature. <clears throat> so why do I think this idea is worth bringing forward and powerful? Um, because I think it is. Um, two kinds of reasons. Um, one, I suppose, is, is more philosophical. And here I want to say something that I suspect will be a little bit provocative. I think, I think Mill is right that the idea of nature as a whole, having a point of view or a meaning or a purpose that speaks in any direct way, certainly in any complete way, to the question how we ought to live with respect to one another or even what we ought to do with nature, is an idea that is only available if you are a monotheist. It's only available if you are committed to the thought that the world is the product of a mind and a mind that in some form, in some way, we can understand as speaking to the questions that we have. Otherwise, there are too many phenomena in nature that are susceptible to too many interpretations and point in too many directions, too much murder, anarchy, suffering. Um, now, I'm willing to be talked out of that. Um, but I emphasize, I don't mean you can only think nature has meaning or value, contains meaning and value if you're a monotheist. I mean, it can only contain one overriding meaning and value that speaks to human purposes in a clear way, if that's what you think. And I look forward to being challenged on that point. Um, so second, I think if we take this as our starting point, it might help us, we take this tradition I've been talking about as our starting point, to produce a different way of talking about nature than we've been accustomed to. Because much of environmental politics and even environmental lawmaking has been oriented to the thought that we need to figure out what nature's value is and how we can protect and honor and promote the well-being of a nature that is independent of us, that was here before us and will be here after us. I think that idea is a beautiful, powerful idea, and I think it's gone. I think it's gone because we live in a time that some scientists have begun calling the Anthropocene, by which they mean something like the age of man. What they mean is we live in a time when we have changed everything. When there is no place from the upper atmosphere to the deep sea that is not transformed chemically, biologically, by the human hand, and that's accelerating accelerating through climate change, but not only through climate change, also through mass extinctions, also through the toxification of many natural systems. <clears throat> and in that world, the quest, asking the question in these terms, what nature are we going to make, is not hubris. It's only hubris if we think we have an easy answer. It's unavoidable. It's forced on us. We've forced it on ourselves. And that, it seems to me, means that there is much to be said for saying that our ways of talking about nature have always been ways of picking out parts of the natural world, things that happen there, places, processes, certain relationships within species, among species, 
and finding there exemplars and reminders of what we can admire, what we can be instructed by, what we can be moved by. That talking about nature and looking at nature has always been partly a way of talking to one another and figuring out what we're going to do together. And those questions are inseparable now because what we do together, how we get our energy, how we get our food, what technologies we develop and use, those questions are also, um, the answers we give to those questions are also the answer to the question, what kind of world are we going to make? They aren't separable. Um, so, uh, I think that the tradition that says in interpreting nature we have always been inventing nature as well, that we can't get human meaning out of our interpretation of nature and that it wouldn't make sense to us if we could, um, is a starting point for the kinds of problems that we confront now, which involve asking in a time when we hardly have the power to answer the question well, but there it is, that's our situation, um, asking what kind of world we're going to help to bring into being. Those are, um, those are the thoughts I look forward to discussing with you next. Thank you.